inviting me to uh, uh, to take a talk on an important topic. So, strider in a young child, and when do I, do I need to worry? Now, this is a common scenario in in a pediatric uh, practice that a parent comes in and says that my child is having some sort of a noisy breathing, and and I am too worried about it, and obviously so. So, how do we go about sorting out a particular child who presents to you in an OPT setting? With Strider, and what are we going to do about it? So, so we'll talk about the correct recognition of the respiratory noise because the the algorithm actually starts once the respiratory noise has been correctly identified. Uh, how is the strider produced? We'll talk about in brief about the etiology of acute versus a persistent strider. We'll talk about the site of obstruction of strider. Uh, how do we approach a child clinically? And how do we investigate a child with strider regarding the radiology and the airway endoscopy? So this is what a pediatric airway looks like. And if we look at this part of the airway, then this is basically the, the supraglottic area, the glottis, the subglottis, and the extra thoracic part of the trachea. And this is the part of the airway which produces a sound which is called as strider. So strider is basically a high-pitched sound and usually inspiratory. So usually you will have a sound like this. <laughs> So usually this side, a sort of a sound is heard uh, in a particular child. Now, this part of the airway, which is marked with blue, is the nasopharyngeal airway and the oropharyngeal airway, which produces a sound which is called as a stutter or a snore when the child is sleeping. And it is more like this sort of a sound. So that is that has a typically different character as compared to a harsh inspiratory. And this is the intrathoracic part of the trachea, which leads to an, usually an expiratory type of a sound, which is more of musical and is called as. So these would be usually expiratory and would be musical sound, which will be heard like this. Mm -hmm. So that is the type of sound which is heard with wheeze. Now, we could further classify this wheeze as a monophonic or a polyphonic wheeze, and we could also localize a wheeze to one side. So if it involves the trachea, then you will find that the wheeze is heard on both sides of the chest equal intensity. If this wheeze is localized to one side, then it signifies that there is obstruction to the ipsilateral bronchus which is happening. So for example, if you have a foreign body here in the right main bronchus, then you will find actually that air entry is decreased on the right side and a monophonic B is heard on the right side. With involvement of the small airways, it leads to more of a polyphonic wheezing, which means that the bees will be different in character at different parts of the chest. So if you put your stethoscope here or here or here or on the left side, then the the wheezing would be different because the different bronchi are in different phases of bronchoconstriction. Also, if you put your stethoscope only at one place for a minute or two, you will find that the intensity of wheeze changes because there, there can be a difference in the amount of bronchoconstriction which is happening and it can change with time. So that is how we decipher how you recognize a respiratory sound. Right. Now that is the the entry point for evaluation. Now, let's look at this further. So how is the strider produced? So as you can see in, in this image, that we are talking about the intrathoracic part of the trachea, and this is the intrathoracic part of the trachea. Now, once you have obstruction to the intrathoracic part of the trachea, spare air, what works is the atmospheric pressure and what works is the tracheal. And what happens is, the tracheal pressures are high during ins uh, the, the atmospheric pressures are high during inspiration, which leads to an inspiratory collapse. And 
vice versa happens to the X. So you have a classical inspiratory type of extraction. On the other hand, if you have a lesion which is there in the intrathoracic part of the trachea, what works is the tracheal pressures and the fluid pressures, and the physiology is the other way around, and you have intrathoracic obstruction during expiration, and you have an expiratory time. Or there can be situations when the lesions are fixed, for example, a cicatrized type of subglottic stenosis or a tracheal stenosis, which does not move at all, and that leads to a consistent sound during inspiration, and that is what is called as biphasic stride. We can make huge strider. What can be the etiology of the huge strider? So we all know commonest etiology are viral, viral laryngotracheal bronchitis through present to the URI cough and wheeze. We all know about it, and I'm not going to give any further details on that. Uh, the other common etiology which has been cited but not very commonly seen in Indian setup is an epiglottitis. We have all read about it, toxic child, drooling, and a sick child requiring antibiotics. Now, what additional causes we should always keep in mind whenever you are dealing with a young child who presents to you with a huge strider? So, think in terms of a retropharyngeal abscess in a young child where there is no viral infection. The child more has a stutter type of a voice, and the child is a sick child, which is not improving. So think in terms of a retropharyngeal abscess, which can be easily missed. In addition, realize that diphtheria or laryngeal form of diphtheria can still be there. A toxic child, there would be membranes in the throat. So diphtheria is still not out from the Indian setup. So especially in the child who is not improving, do examine the throat, although usually we would say that in a child with spider, do not attempt to examine the throat, but there can be a situation when it can help you if the child is not improving. And the third would be a foreign body, especially a, a laryngeal foreign body. So uh, a history of choking, a history of aspiration and a weak cry would help you to, to, to actually decipher whether you are dealing with a foreign body in the larynx. Now, let's go on to persistent strider uh, in a child. Right, so let's start with a case. So this is a two-month-old boy who presents to us for evaluation of noisy breathing. So this child is, was three kgs at birth. Now, when we dig out in the history, we realize that the, the noisy breathing started around one to two weeks of age. Mainly heard when the child is active, when the child is sleeping, the child is absolutely well. The child is breathing well. And on examination, we have a mild inspiratory spider. The child does not have any retractions. And the current weight is fine. The child is growing fine. It's five kgs. So the question is that what is, what is the respiratory noise? Well, it is a strider. Now the second question is that why is this child having a strider? What is the diagnosis? And how would you counsel these parents? These parents are quite anxious. Uh, how would you counsel these parents? So this is the first case. Now, most people tend to believe that this child would be having a laryngomalacia, possibly a mild laryngomalacia, and it's going on go off with time. Right? So we do understand that laryngomalacia is the commonest laryngeal abnormality which we see. It is a self-limiting condition. The onset is usually around two to four weeks after birth. Uh, it can slightly progress up to six to eight months and gradually starts to resolute and usually goes away between a year of age to one and a half to two years of age. Now, the question is that, am I absolutely comfortable in saying that this strider is secondary to a laryngomalacia? And People who say, yes, I would like to ask that how are we certain? How do we say that this child has laryngomalacia? The second question is that if, if you don't say that, then would you refer this child for a bronchoscopy? Okay. And the better question would be that when should I refer a child with strider for a bronchoscopy. So that is the best question which we can formulate here. So let's look at this further. That I usually divide 
children with strider or we are talking about young children who present with a congenital form of strider which are persistent into two broad groups so one are called as happy striders where uh, they are doing well they are gaining weight it is a mild strider they do not have an expiratory component to strider the child is comfortable feeding well growing well and you have a good follow up and you have a good rapport with parents the other could be a child who has red flag signs and we are just going to talk about it. so this group of children who present to you with happy strider will form a major chunk of your practice but you will definitely have lots of patients who present to you with strider who have a red flag sign so you cannot miss the red flag sign strider this is the group of children who would require investigations and we'll see how when and the group who has happy strider possibly you can go on to have an expected treatment because this is a group of patients who might have laryngomalacia most probably so let's classify this further and see so what we can do is that we can either do a bronchoscopy or we can do something known as a transoral flexible laryngoscopy in infants which can be done as an operative procedure as well do not require a lot of sedation and with these children you can do it without sedation and the aim is just to look at the larynx you are not going beyond the larynx you are not sedating you are not giving local anesthesia either you can go transorally or you can use the nasal approach that can be done in the opd and can be done easily so that's one thing which can be done the other thing is that we may not do anything and counsel these parents that this is possible that this child has a laryngomalacia and we keep you in follow up and see now let's look at this second child who is a month old and has strider for past 20 to 25 days but has severe inspiratory retractions now now once we we got this child we realized that this child has some uh, some uh, retractions which are there and this child is not as well so this child has some red flag signs so so we we went ahead and did a bronchoscopy for this child and i'll show you a brief clip of the bronchoscopy now as you look uh, look in this bronchoscopy the, this is the epiglottis which you see and this epiglottis is actually omega shaped epiglottis or is curled uh, on its own and if you look at the airy epiglottic folds and the arytenoid cartilages they actually they actually would collapse into the glottic chink during the inspiration and that leads to an inspiratory strike so this is also a child who has laryngomalacia but still this child would deserve some evaluation because this is still into a moderate category and this child has inspiratory retractions now you can also have severe cases like this girl who was 3 and a half months of age when we saw this child was 2.5 kg at birth and at 3 months at three and a half months this child was just 2.9 kg this child had strider with retractions this child had lot of feeding difficulties and this child had failure to thrive now when we did a bronchoscopy for this child the epiglottis was totally floppy and it was curling on its own and entering into the blood i couldn't get a hang of the video because of this lockdown so, so apologies regarding that so this child actually had the most severe form of laryngomalacia and actually underwent an airy epiglottoplasty for correction so that, can you be slightly louder or come okay. close to your mic okay okay i'll do that sir okay thank you so laryngomalacias can have uh, a severity they can be mild to moderate in most patients like 80% of patients but in 15% patients laryngomalacia can be severe enough might require airy epiglottoplasty or supraglottoplasty and it can be very severe as we have shown and might require a breakfast so laryngomalacia is a spectrum of disorders the mild ones definitely do not require anything and the severe ones do require some sort of surgery now this is the the a1 is a mild form of laryngomalacia where you see that the epiglottis is absolutely normal but the the arytenoids seem to be prolapsing in with respiration that is the that is the type 1 form of laryngomalacia 
the type 2 as i had shown you the second case the epiglottis is curled on and the area and the and the arytenoids also seem to be collapsing with inspiration so that is the second type of laryngomalacia and third is this type of laryngomalacia which i was talking about in the third baby which which i had shown you the epiglottis seem to curl on so it 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 turns on its own curls on its own enter into the glottis and these are children who are really sick and need to be operated so laryngomalacias can be of different varieties now the second question is that are all striders secondary to a laryngomalacia do we have any other diagnosis well let's see so i'll show you a few cases because that is something which will uh, which you might remember and at the end we'll try and summarize with some theoretical background so you will definitely find some clinical videos here you will also find some bronchoscopy here uh, so the idea is to sensitize you that uh, a lot of diagnosis are missed uh and we should we should actually think about these once we are dealing with a child with stride so this child was referred to me as a severe uh, laryngomalacia and this child was quite sick and admitted in a different hospital with severe respiratory retractions so this is the this is the child uh, and this is the video which we had made when this child came to us for a bronchoscopy as you look at this child uh this child has a lot of inspiratory retractions which can be easily seen this child still needs a lot of oxygen and the co2s were also high so uh, the, the 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 referring pediatrician actually thought that this child has a laryngomalacia might need a area epiglottoplasty as the, as the previous child now now once we did a bronchoscopy for this child this child was totally different Now, if you look at this child, the the glottis is absolutely fine. You can see very good, very fine area epiglottic fold. The arytenoids are very well seen. There is no floppiness which is seen in the uh, in the epiglottis. But if you look at this carefully, then look at the movement of the vocal cords. Are the cords moving during inspiration? So if you look at this carefully, the movement of the cords is is quite minimal. So this child is having difficulty. In, in abduction of the vocal cords so actually this child has an abductive cord palsy which is which is a congenital variety we could not find a cause of this vocal cord palsy as most palsies are idiopathic so if you look at this video rest everything is normal even the trachea the lower uh, the lower area was absolutely normal so this child had problem with the vocal cords it was diagnosed with an abductive cord palsy this 2 months old boy had noisy breathing since birth had no significant distress and was feeding well so initially kept as a laryngomalacia by the treating physician and, and i would say correctly uh, this child did not have any big red flag signs but now this child was admitted with fever cough and cold so had a bronchiolitis uh, like illness got admitted to the icu but the problem was that the stridor increased the distress was persisting that is the second problem and this child has a persistent oxygen requirement so this child wasn't improving even after the usual bronchiolitis would improve so we went ahead and thought that let's do a bronchoscopy and see is something fishy which is going on this child is not behaving like a typical laryngomalacia which you would, which you would see and and let's see see this video and see what happened so you can see this area so what is this so this is actually a valicular cyst which is there this is a big valicular cyst which is sitting above the epiglottis in the base of the tongue and it is you can see it is it is actually compressing the epiglottis and the vocal cords so we have a good view here this large large cyst cyst which was there which was sitting there so this child underwent a marsupialization of the cyst and remained well there now this is another similar sort of a child who was 7 months of age had stridor since the first month of life someone added the bronchoscopy but we did not have images and was told that this child has a laryngomalacia and some tracheomalacia now again admitted with a bronchiolitis and the current issues were similar distress persisting beyond 12 days not improving already received steroids and adrenal nebulization and again a persistent oxygen so we weren't sure that whether we should again go in and look at this child this child had a bronchoscopy but i never had videos or images to be confident and and 
it was it was a shock to me when i did this bronchoscopy again the the epiglottis as you can see is absolutely fine the ary epiglottic folds the arytenoids are fine these are the cords and what you see below the cord is a, is a, is a congenital subglottic stenosis so this is a congenital subglottic stenosis and we could not pass in a 3.6 mm bronchoscope through this stenosis segment so this was like a cotton mayer type 3 subglottic stenosis and that was persisting since birth obviously and leading to stridor so you can see this subglottic stenosis below the vocal cord so well moving vocal cords and below you can see a very pinpoint type of a glottic opening or subglottic opening which is seen now another one a 6 months old boy who has noisy breathing since birth on nebulization on most days no response and no admission so a well looking child who has some noisy breathing which has been there throughout on nebulization always no response and not admission i hope this audio works for you all <laughs> can you hear the audio yeah i can so the question is what is the respiratory noise okay so if you look at this carefully then then the first first thing which we have to take care is that is it actually a strider which is inspiratory and a harsh inspiratory sound or this is actually something different which might be an actually a wheeze so this child actually has an expiratory sound and more of a musical sound so this child actually does not have a strider but a audible form of a monophonic wheeze so that is that is why i have kept this video here and this tells me that this child will have some obstruction to trachea which has to be congenital because it has it has been there since birth and this child hasn't been improved yet. so what what can this be obstruct what can this obstruction be due to so it can be either intrathoracic or extrathoracic uh, obstruction intrathoracic can be a tracheomalacia and uh, in the tracheal wall an extra thoracic could be something which is stressing on the trachea which can either be a cyst like a bronchogenic cyst or a neuroenteric cyst or a more common form would be a vascular ring so we went ahead and we did a bronchoscopy for this child and when we did a bronchoscopy we could see that the anterior and the posterior tracheal walls and you can see the anterior and the posterior tracheal walls were approximating and as we went down uh, into the trachea we could see the the carina in both the main bronchi so you can see this is the anterior tracheal wall and the, this is the posterior tracheal wall in a very small chink like opening which is seen in between and as i am going down into the trachea you will be able to see both the bronchi very well so there was a significant obstruction to the mid part of the trachea this is not like a tracheomalacia where the obstruction is more dynamic it is more during expiration uh, and otherwise which is uh, and reduces during inspiration and as you come down you can see the right main bronchus very well and the uh, right upper lobe bronchus as well so the same day the child underwent a ct angiography to look at any extrathoracic tracheal obstruction and if you look at this this uh, this image so it is a cross sectional image contrast view uh, the mediastinal window and and you can see two arches here so this is the right aortic arch which is there and this is the left aortic arch which is there and you have a trachea and the esophagus which is actually compressed in between and most of these patients will have some amount of dysphagia which is going on so congenital anomalies we know that they're not as common uh, and the most common of these anomalies are laryngomalacia which is followed by vocal cord palsies subglottic stenosis webs atresias hemangiomas sacculosis laryngocele and laryngeal tracts now why i have shown you all these videos is not to mesmerize you with bronchoscopies but just to make you 
aware that all these diagnoses are definitely seen in clinical practice. And all these patients which I have bronchoscoped upon have been referred to me by my colleagues in pediatrics. Now, how do you pick that odd man out? That is the question which everyone is going to ask me that you cannot send every patient with strider for a bronchoscopy. So look at red flag signs, strider since birth, laryngomalacia usually start later. Any child who has strider associated with retractions, any child who has a biphasic strider or has an expiratory component to strider as well, any child who has a monophonic wheezing, or if the wheezing is persisting beyond six to months of age and it doesn't seem to improve. So these are the, the, the red flag signs where you might be dealing with a non-laryngomalacia type of a strider. So congenital striders could be because of pharyngolaryngomalacia, retrogonathias, pallicular cysts, vocal cord palsies, laryngeal webs. There can be subglottic stenosis, hemangiomas, vascular rings, tracheomalacia, or congenital tracheal stenosis. So let's go on to some, some children which we, we, we have seen with acquired form of strider. So this is a one-year-old boy who was referred to us with cough and noisy breathing for a month. So for the past one month only, this child has a noisy breathing, no significant fever, and there was a weird history on choking after, after getting peanuts. Now, sorry. Now, this child was, was admitted three times at a hospital. Got antibiotics, bronchodilators, not remained well as per parents. They were very clear that this child never remained well. This child has been having noisy breathing. This child never improved after antibiotics, bronchodilators, and steroids. So what are we dealing with? So we have three x-rays here. If you look at these three x-rays, you can pass them as normal. But yes, there's some hyperinflation which can be seen in all these three x-rays. So you see flattened type of diaphragms in these x-rays. They're more black than normal. Again, flattened diaphragms and slightly more black than normal. So what are we dealing with? Noisy breathing. Can this be a bacterial bronchitis? Can this be a foreign body? Can this be something like a bronchiolitis of the chance? Well, we don't know. We have to investigate this child. This history of choking was quite weird. So on examination, we could find that this child has a monophonic wheeze. So that made me suspicious that this is possibly a foreign body which I am dealing with. The first thing which I should do is not a CT, is to do a bronchoscopy and extract the foreign body if I found. Now, this is the this is a bronchoscopic clip uh, of the bronchoscopy and and as you enter the trachea, this is what was there. So there was a piece of peanut which was lying in the trachea for a month and no granulations at all. And this child has been unwell because of this, this peanut which was there. Now what we do further is that we give some amount of sedation or propofol to this child in our PICU. We can easily extract these foreign bodies with the flexible scope itself. So you can see this gormia basket is going on uh, from the bronchoscope channel to the flexible bronchoscope channel. And we open up this gormia and uh, this foreign body can be extracted. So this is the dormia which opens up and grasps the foreign body. So now this foreign body is grasped and we can, which we can come out. So the whole process takes around five minutes. We, we avoid total uh, we don't need to take this child to OT. We don't need to give gentle anesthesia and the cost reduces significantly. And uh, over time with the flexible scope, uh, we have been removing all vegetable type foreign bodies. So we have removed peanuts, kernel of peanuts, chana, we have removed, uh, we have removed a, a piece of clove. We have been removed non-organic foreign bodies like wrappers of biscuit, plastic pieces, and even sometimes sharp foreign bodies as well. So usually you can pass in a dormia basket like this. We have different types of instruments which can be used for extraction of foreign bodies through flexible scopes, not rigid scopes. But occasionally if you have a sharp foreign body, if you have subglottic foreign bodies, I'll show you one. Or if you have a very badly impacted foreign body, then you sometimes need a rigid bronchoscopy to remove these foreign bodies. So this one-year-old girl, 
uh, had choking after eating peanuts. But as the parents, the child remained well, so the pediatrician thought that this foreign body possibly has been expelled out. Now, this child was admitted in another hospital in the first week of February with some wheezing. At discharge, the child improved but never completely settled. Was seen again in February third week. The strider was persisting. At the end of March, the strider increased, and this child was referred to us. When this child came to us, the child had severe respiratory distress, 80% saturation on room air, and a severe respiratory strider and a weak crack. So we were thinking that we, we are possibly dealing with a laryngeal foreign body. Now we we took this child to OT. We first attempted a flexible bronchoscopy, and I'll show you a small clip. And you can easily see that just between the vocal cords there is a foreign body which is lying there. There is a foreign body which was just lying in the subglottic area. And usually these foreign bodies are not attempted with flexible scopes universally. So we went ahead, did a rigid bronchoscopy, and this foreign body was removed. It was a piece of kernel of the peanut. But this child was 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 desaturating, and we could not extubate this child uh, on the on the OT table, and we were not sure what's happening. So the anesthetist thought that let's repeat a flexible scopy and see what's happening. And when we repeated flexible bronchoscopy, so this is when we were withdrawing our scope from the trachea and coming upwards. And I'll show you what happened. So this is what happened. So very bad granulation which was seen in the subglottic area, which was actually obstructing. So this child was reintubated, put on steroids. This child was ventilated for two days in the PICU. When the leak appeared, we extubated this child, did a repeat bronchoscopy. All the granulations had disappeared, and this child was sent home. So think of foreign bodies which present commonly in these age groups. Now, we had another interesting child who was three years old, was diagnosed with some laryngeal mass and operated. This was an international patient. No one knew what's happening. There was a huge, la uh, huge problem with language. So I, I got a call from the ENT that this child is having a severe strider and, and come and do a bronchoscopy. We're not sure what we are dealing with. They didn't want to do a tracheostomy because they did not know a cause. And when we did a bronchoscopy, there was something which was very interesting, which we came up. And I'll show you a small clip here. And these are all laryngeal papillomas. What you see a laryngeal mass here. Is these are all laryngeal papillomas which are there, which were obstructing the, the glottic opening. So with the bronchoscope, we had to do a fiber optic intubation for the Saturday evening. And this child went to the OT on Monday morning and the ENT is resected. All these papillomas with laser. So these are all cases of uh, uh, an acquired strider which you can see day in and day out of your practice. So I think I'll leave a few cases because we are running a bit short of time, otherwise we'll not have any time for discussion. So I'll show you one interesting one. This child was referred with a with a strider only during sleep. So this is this is the, the, the breathing pattern of this child when the child is sleeping. And you'll be amazed to look at this child once the child is awake. So during wake, this child is absolutely well. So what was happening to this child? So, if you look at the, the upper airway endoscopy of this child, these are large adenoids and tonsils which are obstructing. So this is a live bronchoscopy view of how an, an obstructive sleep apnea happens in children. So you have an adenoid below, which is here, at 6 o'clock position, and you have two large palatine tonsils at, at, at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock position, which are obstructing. So as the child breathes in, these tonsils and the adenoids totally totally obstructs the inlet and leads to a severe form of obstructive sleep apnea uh, and that leads to a noisy breathing during sleep and the child is absolutely well, well when the child is weak. So kids snore because their airways can flop but they also snore because they have large adenoids and tonsils and there are reports that you can have adenotonsillar hypertrophy presenting with sleep apnea even in infants. So it's not uncommon below three years or below five years as it is usually thought. We see a lot of children with OSA with an adenotonsillar hypertrophy below that age group and as I said, even in infants. And the other common group where you will find strider is a group of children who present with an extubation failure. Uh, so we, we always help our intensivists dealing with, uh, with, with sick children whenever we, are, whenever we are called to do that. 
Now, in brief, they can have many causes of extubation failure. For example, this child had a had a tracheoesophageal fistula, which was a recurrent tracheoesophageal fistula and could not be extubated. So the surgeons actually requested for a bronchoscopy, and when we did a bronchoscopy, we could find large granulations on the glottis. So these are large granulations which are seen on the on the supraglottic apparatus, and you can see very bad vocal cords which were there. And when we went in the trachea, we could also find a trachea, uh, also find a tap opening. And when we inserted a dye, uh, which is methylene blue in the in the esophagus, we could find it coming through the trachea. So the surgeons were also surprised that this child actually had a tap which was persisting even after surgery. So all all extubation failures are not same. And this child was a post-operative case of uh, a BT shunt had an extubation failure. Uh, we were not sure why, and but this child, as you can see, there, there's a hardly any movement of the vocal cords. So this child actually had had a post cardiac surgery abductor cord palsy, which was actually leading to an extubation failure. This is another child who actually came to us after this child was suspected to have subglottic stenosis. And, and the ENTs already had done a direct laryngoscopy with their uh, direct laryngoscope and operated upon this child. Why this child was referred to us is because of the persistent oxygen requirement. And when we went in, we saw that the glottis, the subglottis was absolutely normal. And what this child actually had, so this is the subglottic area, which is absolutely normal, a very small granulation tissue, which is usually found in tracheostomized children. And as, as you look at this bronchoscopy, there's a very bad tracheobronchitis which is persisting. And this child grew as pergillus in, in the bowel specimen. And after giving two weeks of amphotericin B, this child could be decannulated totally and there was no subglottic stenosis. But you can have typical subglottic stenosis post extubation, so always be careful as this child had post VSD surgery. So persistent striders which are acquired, you can have an adenoid hypertrophy, you can have vocal cord palsies, webs, post intubation subglottic stenosis, we can have hemangiomas, we can have laryngeal traumas. We had seen recently had one child who presented to us, and you can have a respiratory papillomatosis as we have seen. So once you have a child who presents to you with a persistent strider, look at three things, look at the respiration, look at the voice, and look at the sphincter function. So all these three things are important. So look at the quality of respiratory sound. It is inspiratory, it is expiratory, it is a biphasic strider. Is it worsening with crying, feeding, straining, changing position and sleep? Also look at the voice, whether it is muffled, whether it is weak, whether it is a hoarse voice which can help you to localize the lesion. Also look, always look at the sphincter function because a lot of children can be aspirating. So look at choking, coughing, gagging or regurgitation which is leading to an aspiration pneumonia because you can be leading, uh, dealing with a, a laryngotracheoesophageal cleft or you might be dealing with an H type of tracheoesophageal fistula or cord palsy or a discoordinated swallow. So always assess these three functions independently. Also assess the general condition of the child, the weight gain, the build of the child, look at any dysmorphic facies, the size and position of mandible and tongue, potency of the nasal airways, flaring of nasal air and nasi, mouth breathing, and retraction which tells us about the work of breathing. And do remember to examine the rest of them as well. And flexible bronchoscopy is or would remain the most important diagnostic investigation to consider in these patients. It will tell us about the structure of the anatomy. And it also tells us about the dynamics and the physiology. And that is the reason why a flexible bronchoscopy is much superior to doing a rigid bronchoscopy or a rigid laryngoscopy under general anesthesia because you cannot look at the dynamics which a flexible bronchoscope can, especially if you can titrate the amount of sedation which you are giving to a particular child. So finally, we conclude here by the take home messages that strider is a symptom and it is not a diagnosis. And we should always think about that, what am I dealing with? Am I dealing with a laryngomalacia, which is, which is a mild one? Or, or you can also have a non-laryngomalacia, but a mild lesion at the moment. So I still remember a child who was referred to us for a bronchoscopy, and this child had a severe strider. And this child, two weeks back, 
was seen by one of our very respected colleagues. And at that time, the, the stride was mild. And at that time, he, he thought, and I, I agree at this moment as well, that the stride is quite mild, we can follow up this child. Now, when this child was kept in follow up, this strider worsened, and this was actually a hemangioma. So, we're not trying to say that mild striders are always laryngomalacious. You can have a, a alternate differential diagnosis as well. And that is the reason why I am saying that you should have a good follow up and explain to parents that it appears to be mild, might be a laryngomalacia because it is mild, does not have red flag signs. But do look for red flag signs, and if they appear, please come back to us. To do a good history and physical examination, look, look for red flag signs. An airway endoscopy is an important adjuvant to the diagnosis in a persistent spread. So we end here and we can take up any questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Ankit, for a very uh, lucid journey uh, 